Hello, my name is Anna Faust and I'm a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at the University of Bremen in Germany. In this short video, I would like to give you an insight into one of our research projects called Novell, an IoT Fab Lab for the University of Gaumbere in Cameroon. And on the other side, to talk about what is the Internet of Things and how to design it in a minimalistic way. So the very first question which we should answer is what is actually the Internet of Things? Is it a new research field? Is it a new technique? Is it a new technology? It is actually not. It is a combination of existing technologies which have been around for some time, but their combination is new and quite novel and innovative and uh, allows for new applications and deployments. So it's typically a combination of embedded hardware, embedded computing, limited resources, cloud computing, machine learning, wireless low-power communications, but also data science, security, and many others. When we're talking about how an Internet of Things is built out, is actually that on one side we have the so-called Internet of Things devices, so sometimes also called the edge devices, which can be simple things like just one single microcontroller or a light bulb, it can be something, some sensors inside of a vehicle, of a motorbike, or of a truck. They can be also some temperature sensors for environmental monitoring, light sensors for agriculture, rain sensors, and so on and so forth. The assumption is, that's why they're called also the Internet of Things, is that those things are actually connected directly to the Internet in the meaning of that they have some sort of a wireless communication on board, like Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, but also some other newer technologies like LoRa or NB-IoT and many others, in order to connect through the internet to some sort of a cloud service or a server in general. Very usually we talk about the so-called Internet of Things loop in order to represent and to visualize what is actually such a device doing and continuously does throughout its lifetime? Obviously, because it has sensors on board, it senses the environment. For example, if it's a temperature sensor, then I take regularly the temperature sensing data. For example, every 10 to 15 minutes in an agricultural scenario. Then I exchange this data either with other things or I send them to the cloud service, so exchange or connect somehow. Then this data has be, is being analyzed either on the cloud or on the device itself or somewhere in between. And a decision is taken. Sometimes this decision is just for, let's say, a data science reason or for backup and to analyze later after much of the data has been gathered, let's say after months of environmental monitoring. It can be also directly in real time, for example, if we are interested in uh, smart irrigation for agricultural scenarios, then of course we take the decision relatively often and relatively fast after taking the data, whether to irrigate and how much. What is now a minimal solution for the IoT and why is that needed? One problem with the IoT is that it's quite expensive at the end, not only because we need the sensors and the so-called edge or IoT devices, but actually because also the connection to the cloud is quite expensive. The cloud service itself is sometimes, of course, also can be for free, especially for private people or for small uh, non-governmental organizations for, let's say, non-business purposes. But uh, for business, it becomes very quickly quite expensive. And of course, if we're talking about many devices, let's say that we put devices on each of our trucks in a bigger logistical company, then it becomes also expensive to connect those devices directly to the internet, not only because the internet connection is costly, but also because the, the communication itself to that internet connection to the cloud service is expensive in terms of energy needed on the IoT device, which drags additional problems with them that, for example, the battery has to be exchanged very often, which is expensive not only because of the battery, but because of the people who have to exchange these batteries. So that's why we're sometimes more interested in some sort of a really minimalistic solutions, which are not only cheaper 
but also very well suited for people who do not have technological background, maybe only have pro only primary or mid-school finished, so they're also not very literate, let's say. And the device has to be really very, very simple, very simple to use and should not require a lot of technological background, knowledge, expertise. And on the other side, of course, has to be very cheap. These solutions are typically looked for for developing countries, especially about business use cases. But also developed countries are very important here because sometimes, of course, uh, large deployment, let's say, like fire detection is also hard to finance also in developed countries. So a minimal solution would be something which we connect the devices not to a cloud service through the internet, through Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, but we actually connect it directly to an uh, edge device, directly to the end users, for example, directly to their smartphones, or we don't even connect them, these solutions, to the end user, but we leave the, uh, the device as a standalone device. An example of an IoT device in general, before I go into one example of a minimalistic solution, is the PyCon PySense. These are very um, quite well-known devices from uh, the company PyCon, who have a whole family of devices with various sensors on board, with various communication technologies on board. For example, this one has an accelerometer, temperature and humidity, pressure and light. Very interesting for logistical or agricultural scenario. Um, and it's quite small inside. So, in, for example, this box has been opened up in order to show also the AA battery inside. So the whole box is not much bigger than one AA battery, a little bit wider than that one. And there is an external antenna to connect, of course, to some sort of an end user or cloud service if you wish to. How do you program such devices is something very, um, let's say, weird for beginners especially and for non-technical experts. You have the, tech the device itself, which here is number one. You need a laptop or a computer in general to connect to this device, typically via a USB connection, in order to be able actually to program this device, so to tell it what to do and how to do it and when to do it. For example, take the temperature reading every 10 minutes, store it uh, on the device and every two hours send the average to the cloud service. This is a typical IoT, very simple application. And then uh, what you use for programming exactly these devices and many more IoT devices, there are of course also other options, is here it's MicroPython which is becoming more and more popular in the developing, in the developing community. Um, but there are also other options like just pure C, some operating systems like Riot, or uh, for example, Arduino is still a very, um, uh, a very popular option here. And of course, you can use some communication technologies. Here we have some examples like Wi-Fi, LTE, Sigfox or LoRa, uh, Bluetooth, but also NB-IoT, which you can or you don't have to use in order to implement your applications. What kind of sensors exist? This is something which uh, is also a question which I get very often from my partners from in, in our research projects. A very typical application is temperature and humidity. These are sensors which are very, very cheap. For example, a temperature sensor will be able to track temperatures between minus 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. So in the bright sun in Africa and going to deep winter somewhere in north of Germany or Scandinavia. A very typical sensor is also GPS, which is uh, uh, sometimes people don't really realize that it's just a normal sensor, which gives you the coordinate, your current position which is, however, for example, very energy hungry. And its precision is typically five to 15 meters. That depends a little bit on the place where you're using it, of course, whether the satellite connect connections are really good or uh, also on the, the, on the sensor itself. And you can put such a sensor on an IoT device and some IoT devices have it already integrated. It's also not very cheap. So compared to temperature and humidity, which is below one euro, 
here we're talking about some sort of a 20 euros if it's not already integrated into your IoT platform. Typical other sensors are light and UV radiation, very important for structural monitoring in order to track the radiation which is um, uh, uh, on, on a particular structure like on a bridge or in a building. Uh, or for agricultural scenarios, of course, also very important. Gas sensors are also very popular, especially again in agriculture, all in food security and in food transportation. There is also accelerometers, pressure sensors, and really many, many more, including also health sensors like blood pressure, bl um, blood oxygen, and so on and so forth. Another question is, which we have talked a little bit shortly already, uh, is which communication technologies actually exist? First of all, we can connect, as we already were talking about, we can connect our devices directly to a cloud service which could be like 3G, 4G connection or Wi-Fi connection. Let's go through those a little bit more in detail and discuss their pros and cons. If we look into the first column, which is 3G, 4G, then uh, we know that we need a SIM card and we need a contract with a provider. This is what it means. We need to pay for that contract. So it is quite expensive. Um, and it's very energy hungry, it needs a constant connection to the service provider which makes it energy hungry, which means change the battery very often. Then uh, it is also relatively slow con to connect. So one trick which we're using typically in order to save energy in IoT is that we put on the whole device only from time to time and then we connect to the service provider to the communication service every time we actually uh, wake up, so to say, and do our sensing and sending out and then we go back to sleep. This has the side effect that we need always to reconnect to our communication service, which, uh, for example, for 3G and 4G, the problem is that that takes quite a long of time, that takes up to one or two minutes before you can actually connect. And uh, that's why it makes it a bad alternative for sleeping. It's not a good option to sleep here. However, it has a very high bandwidth, so if we have lots of data, let's say acceleration data, which is a lot of data, or image, or image data, or we have um, audio data, then of course it's a very interesting solution for us. And of course it's connected directly to the internet, which has two, let's say, side effects or two, um, two uh, important properties. First of all, big that we can track it in real time. For example, if we put such a device on a truck or on a motorbike or in a car, we can know from somewhere else where this truck is right now. And what is also interesting, of course, is that the data is re almost real time. So I can see also my sensory data, let's say how the food is going through the transportation process. I can see whether the food is still safe and transported in the right way. Now let's go to Wi-Fi, to our second cup. First of all, we don't need a SIM card this time, but we need access points. You know that uh, without an access point, you cannot connect to Wi-Fi. You need to find first a connection where you're allowed to enter to, and only then you can, um, you can use this communication service. It is not very expensive. A Wi-Fi device, a Wi-Fi component is relatively cheap. You can put it on any IoT devices. Many devices come with that already. It is still quite energy hungry, um, exactly as 3G or 4G, and it's not very fast to connect. It's also not that, uh, let's say, uh, slow to connect as 3G and 4G, but it's still quite, uh, quite uh, slow to connect, which makes it again not a very good option for sleeping and for saving energy. Again, we have a very high bandwidth. Again, very good. We have lots of data to transfer to our cloud service. And again, exactly as for 3G and 4G, it is good. It's connected directly to the cloud. We can track everything, the sensors and the position, for example, in real time. The third option, which I would like to present you today here, is the LoRa technology, which is relatively new technology, about 10 years now, 10-ish approximately, where, again, you need access points and gateways, but those you can install them yourself. And they're also very interesting. <laughs> Uh, networks which are available um, worldwide for free access, at, at least for non-business cases, but also for business cases. So that is a little bit better organized than a Wi-Fi connection. 
Um, it is not expensive at all, uh, nor for the devices, nor for the gateways. It's very energy efficient. This is actually the point of Laura that you can sleep. This is very important. You can save energy. You can send only tiny packets whenever you really need to. There is no connection overhead. So anytime you, you wake up, you can send up your packets immediately. However, there is of course a however here that uh, bandwidth is very low. So as I said, you send only tiny packets here and there with a couple of sensory readings, like let's say temperature, date, GPS, something like that. But you cannot really stream data like images, videos, audio, and so on. And of course, uh, it is not really directly connected to the internet. So um, it, it depends a little bit on how you implement it. So I decided here to put the not directly connected because typically there is a quite a long latency to connect to the internet and you can do it in both ways. You can connect it to the internet directly and have it relatively uh, real time, like with some latency, or you can, connect the, you can connect them to each other directly, which makes it isolated from the internet, but still a lot of applications can be implemented. So the question is, can we avoid communication, even if we were discussing how to connect before? And the answer is yes, we can avoid communication with, for example, having a device which goes only up with sensors, some onboard data storage, and then the data can be either visualized on the device itself in some user-friendly, useful way, or it can be downloaded uh, and visualized later. Let us see such an example. Uh, in the Novell project, we have developed together with our partners from the um, economy department here at the University of Bremen and at the logistical department at the University of Gaunder in Cameroon, we have identified one important application for Cameroon, which is meat tracking. So that the meat which is transported from the slaughterhouses to the supermarkets and to the markets is actually safe when it arrives and that the people who are getting it, who are receiving these meat parcels at the supermarkets, at the markets, at the shops, they can be sure that the, the meat is not rotten, is not foul in any way. So the idea is that we have a device which monitors the temperature of this bag, parcel, package, whatever, uh, whatever, however big it is. And it always compares the temperature to some optimal value. For example, it should be always below five degrees, then we are absolutely safe. And if the temperature, however, exceeds this uh, for some time, let's say 30 minutes, then a lamp, a LED should go on on the device itself in order to signal that there is a potentially a problem and you should be careful about receiving this parcel of meat. Um, there is no communication here required, no cost for SIM cards, no access points, no gateways, no usage, no service providers, no contracts. And however, it cannot be tracked in real time. You only know what is uh, how your meat was doing once it is received on the other side. Here is what we developed. This is how the device looks like. We have a sense, uh, temperature sensor, which you see connected for a long cable so that it can be put directly into the meat, for example. Then we don't have any communication. However, uh, there is a Wi-Fi connection on board, which we're planning to do in order to, in order to get the data for later analysis and visualization. We have an onboard data storage and we have some LEDs in order to signal what's going on with the meat. And we have a button in order to restart the data acquisition to signal to a device that now we have a new parcel, so delete or store the old data and start tracking the data again. The rules are very simple. If the temperature is below five degrees, everything is fine and the green LED is flashing. Um, if it is above 5 degrees for some time, of course not only for a single reading, but for some time, let's say for 30 minutes, then the meat is probably foul and then another LED, for example the red one, can go on and signal to the receiver that there might be a problem, they should be simply careful about it. The exact threshold can be easily changed with the setup which I have told you before, where with the laptop you simply reprogram this device in order to have different thresholds. If you're transporting, for example, not meat, but something like fruit or vegetables and they require different temperatures. 
This is uh, how you use this logger. is actually very easy. You pack your parcel with meat or with some other food. You put inside, you restart it with a button. You put the box inside. You put an avail box inside of this parcel. You close the bag, you transport the meat, and on the other side, you put the device out, and you know by looking into the into the LEDs whether the green and the red one is flashing and you know whether the temperature, the storage temperature was perfectly fine for the, for the transportation or there was a problem. Later on, as I said, you can download the data, for example, the boss of the company, the transportation company can download the data to inspect it very carefully and to discuss, for example, with the transportation company itself or with the drivers what exactly was happening on the way and why this temperature was exceeded and for how long and how to avoid that, for example, in the future. Um, a little bit of a discussion about pros and cons here. It is a very, very simple and cheap solution, which the idea is that everybody with a little bit of support and a little bit of a technical knowledge can develop by themselves in our new fab lab in Cameroon, the IoT fab lab for logistics. It can, this device, such devices can operate over several weeks without any battery change, so you can use them in your normal life without taking too much care of them, and let's say over the weekend you can then change the batteries without any problems. The thresholds can be easily changed, and of course the thresholds or the rules with when to flash which LED can be also much more complex in terms of what do you want to do, but at the same time the logic or the reprogramming effort which you need in order to change these thresholds is actually still very, very long. So what is actually a fab lab? This is a, a, a picture, unfortunately not of Cameroon, because of the pandemic we couldn't uh, get pictures from, uh, from our fab lab directly there, we are still working on that. This is our IoT Fab Lab here at the University of Bremen with some of our PhD students working uh, directly in the lab. The idea is that the Fab Lab, in this case an IoT Fab Lab, is just a place where all of the devices, all of the equipment is already there for you and you can borrow it from different boxes and you can check what you would like to try out. You can take a temperature sensor, you can take a PyCom device or an Arduino device we can put them together, get some help from the tutors because we have an idea, for example, of how to better track, let's say, um, let's say medicine on the transportation or in the logistics or even out of the logistical uh, uh, area. And you can also show these prototypes there to your business partners or to your supervisors or to your colleagues in order to discuss and to see how it can be turned, for example, into an innovative product. All of the hardware and the software is provided in the Fab Lab uh, so that you can easily put your prototypes. You have, of course, later either to pay for those if you would like to keep them, for example, the small prototype, or you simply make your pictures and documentations and you return the hardware so that you don't have even to pay for that. Why should we use IoT, uh, especially in developing countries and especially such minimalistic solutions? Well, it can still save a lot of costs, especially in transportation of perishable goods like food or medicaments and so on. You save costs directly from the, fo fo from the rotten food itself, because in that way uh, you, can, you can follow the problems and you can analyze the problems on the logistical chain that you can, of course, prevent them in the future. And, of course, it gives you also the possibility to select the right logistical partners or to put a little bit on, of pressure on them in order to transport your goods in a better way. And, of course, because you're increasing the quality of your products, also the customer satisfaction will increase. So we'll have more customers, which increases also your revenue. More information is provided on uh, our website, thenovelproject.org where you can see a little bit more about the project itself and some pictures and some more information. And on our GitHub repository, which is the first link here, you can uh, download all of the software definitions and all of the training materials which we have prepared for this project and for use with our Fab Lab IoT in Cameroon. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you will visit our websites and check also our other videos. Thank you very much.